alaikum everybody and welcome to the second week of Step Up, the brand new show for the 21st century Muslimah. In this series, we'll be looking at the issues that affect us as teenagers and how Islam is applicable for us, inshallah. I'm Hafsa. And I'm Ruqayya. So it's been an exciting week with the launch of the show. Oh, it's been amazing, alhamdulillah. So what's on the show today? We'll start off with Ask Big Sister, where Big Sister Hanan will be on the hot seat answering our questions about self-esteem. How can we be confident in ourselves as Muslimas when so much in society can make us feel insecure? It's sure to be a great discussion, inshallah. Inshallah. Then we'll have Sister Khadija taking a look at the fantastic homeless charity, Children of Adam, and speaking to the Muslims working hard behind the scenes. Sister Hannah then tells us about another inspirational Sahabi, Zayd bin Haritha. In our upcoming talent segment, we'll be looking at an up-and-coming poet. Definitely stay tuned for that. We have lots and lots coming up in the next hour, so don't go anywhere. Today on Ask Big Sister, we are discussing what are the effects of social media in our lives. Joining me in this discussion, I have my sisters, Selma. Assalamu alaikum. And Sumaya. Assalamu alaikum. So being constantly online on various devices, sometimes at the same time, has become the norm. Is this a positive thing going forward or not? How important is it to balance? To help us answer these questions, we have with us our big sister, Hanan. <laughs> So, alhamdulillah, Sister Hanan is our new big sister. So, would you want to go ahead and introduce yourself for our viewers, inshallah? Yes, my name is Hanan. Um, I am a master's student studying media in the Middle East. Um, so, there's been an awful lot of discussion surrounding the media. Very so, um, yeah, I'm quite interested to see how this discussion sort of pans out. We look forward to gaining from your insight, inshallah. So, with the media, there's so many things that we can do with just a click of a button. Like, you can post a picture, you can send a message. And sometimes these messages can't be very pleasant. So, are there any consequences to just clicking a button? Um, absolutely. I think that often um, with social media, um, many platforms are given to people who don't aren't even aware or responsible of mm -hmm. how to use it. Um, and it's so important that people are sort of educated and young people are educated and how, what are the ramifications of this? What can happen if I um, retweet this or what can happen if I reply to this? And we're, we're very reactionary on, um, you know, Twitter, that kind of thing. I, I'll focus more on that because that's where people are speaking about so many different views, personal views, political views, that yeah. kind of thing. So. Um, I'll actually give one example of what happened of somebody that I knew um, a long time ago. She was using Twitter and she didn't have that many followers. Um, and she used it to write a piece of information about, she just used it all the time to, 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 to sort express of herself. express herself. Yeah, yeah, people enjoy that to share things, you know, it's that culture of sharing. Um, and she was working at it quite, um, I, I won't say the name of the company, but mm -hmm. it was like a well known kind of. Um, shopping outlet yeah. um, and a celebrity walked in and, and she was tweeting about the celebrity and, and used her handle, her Twitter handle and the celebrity caught, found it and then reported it to the head of the whole department oh and wow. so um, <laughs> what happened was they went through her Twitter and they read all the tweets she'd ever written about perhaps work or mm. whatever it was um, and they called her in and, and she actually got fired. Oh, oh, nice. So we've heard so many stories of this happening, you know, where, where people's personal life are hugely affected by the things that they've said as a result of, you know, just, just reactionary, being reactionary, you know, not thinking. And even in Islam, we're taught to sort of slow down and, and use our aql, you know, yeah. and understand why, you know, what we're saying and why we're saying it mm -hmm. and what we're putting out, you know, all these things, they're a responsibility for all of us, you know. Absolutely. Even like when you're applying for a job or a voluntary position, usually, I don't know if you've noticed, but now they ask for your Facebook, they yes. ask for your Twitter to yeah. do their like background check. They want to know what kind of person you are, you yeah. know. Um, and so I think that's what it is in, in being responsible. <clears throat> Um, it's knowing that when you're putting something out there, you're putting it out for about 175,000 people mm. who are your audience. And the problem is, is people have, they've kind of, because they, you're not able to see your audience straight away, you know, we kind of forget who's out there and who's yeah. watching. There is another actually um, example, just really quickly, uh, especially on Twitter, of a woman who, um, she wrote a tweet that was, that could be construed, misconstrued as, as being racist, when mm. she was actually, um, she was trying to be witty and funny, but it got, it, it, it was completely just, it was wrong, yeah. what she'd said. And um, she boarded a plane to Africa, um, I think Africa was, it was South Africa specifically, um, and by the time that she got to the other side, 
um, her tweet had gone viral and every single person in the world was was commenting on her and she got when she hit the ground um, somebody actually messaged her from she'd known from school and said I'm so sorry this is happening to you mm -hmm. um, she lost her job um, and so many different things happened to her in her personal life and there's also that really dangerous culture of people being humiliated online yeah. um, and ostracized um, and you know we become party to it whether we like it or not when we're mm -hmm. consuming it when we're watching it um, and as Muslims, you know, again, you know, is this is this right, you know, to be party to this kind of thing? Um, and this is the problem with the, with with the media or the internet. It's so quick, you know, it's so fast paced. So we don't we're not given enough time to think about things first, um, mm. and that's really dangerous. Yeah. I think perhaps sometimes people are a little bit socially awkward mm -hmm. and um, they perhaps use social media as a way of compensating that. Do you think um, using social media as a way to fill that void is a positive or a negative thing? Um, that's a really good question because I do often think that, you know, if we look at the role models of who's available today, of, you know, what, who the young people are looking at, it's all the vloggers and bloggers and, and, you know, essentially it's all these YouTube stars that have come, become famous off of just giving bits of personal information out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the ironic thing is that these same people are actually expressing to, to everyone I'm actually socially, I have social anxiety and I have, I've, I've suffered with depression or I've suffered this and I've suffered that and I have insecurities and all these different things. Um, and so on the one end of the spectrum, it's actually massively positive mm -hmm. because so many people can identify with them, young people, and, um, and they can think, okay, I'm not alone in this and, and maybe they might reach out or they might talk to somebody about it. But often it's, it's also quite strange to me because sometimes not always but sometimes the things that we're putting out on social media or, or something about it that it's the disconnection with people it's having fans but not actually being connected with people yeah. um, that can also be a yeah. cause of social anxiety as well and you know if we're if we're looking to these people as being the role models like why 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 are these people the role models when you know they're, they're also struggling you know um, and that could be as a result of using social media you know mm -hmm. feeling disconnected not kind of fostering relationships in a kind of organic manner face-to-face -to -face speaking yeah. to someone you know and that can actually help with your social anxiety and and you know a lot of those I mean, ultimately problems it's not real though is it like if you are out there and you are you like you said not having organic relationships it's like okay what about when you go out into the real world you know exactly and I remember that um, quite recently I think it was a couple a month or two ago there was a woman she was a model on Instagram and um, she just came out and it went viral about yeah. how oh, fake yeah. everything was yeah. right yeah. Um, and she said, in fact, it was it was it wasn't just you know fake or or you know horrible to be in or anything like that. Or she was constantly trying to keep up. She said it was actually detrimental. It was actually having terrible effects on her, and she's never felt more alone and isolated. Um, so that's huge, you know. And, yeah. and the problem is, we're told this constantly. They're telling us, look, we're feeling isolated, and yet we still we use it to to, to kind of as we're saying fill a void, you know. When we can't sit with ourselves and and kind of be by ourselves yeah. without having to just switch on an app and, and fill our time with doing something like that when in fact it's 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 nice to be in solitude every once in a while and it's good to use that for worship in fact as well yeah. so um, yeah I think it's um it, it's important to know how we're using our time and and is that a reason for our stress or anxiety and that kind of thing yeah I mean you did touch upon the harms but so what about like on a individual level like when you are putting information out there whether it be personal whether it be light banter whatever it is what are the ultimate harms both practically yeah. and spiritually as well um see this is the thing i think it's really tough with um putting things out there because um on the one hand you've got you know you can be sharing positive images or positive statuses about religious things um, or anything that that could be beneficial you know bits of information knowledge it's a great way the internet is great for that you know I feel like we're living at a time now where in fact it, social media is not always a negative thing at all in fact I think we're really lucky in the fact that we get to examine other people's perspectives mm -hmm. just by the uh, as you said at the click of the button I think that's amazing yeah. um, and that's something that the older generations didn't actually have which is great but then it's kind of like at what cost as well how far are we going what are we sharing are we thinking about it um, are we being reactionary as I was saying before and there is a process that happens that it can actually have the counter effect of when you're sharing something for example you're putting out a persona 
So if you're, 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 you're sharing a hadith or, or you know, something, a religious uh, quote or something like this, or an Islamic quote, or, um, you know, are we putting out a persona? Are we doing it just to, for show? Mm -hmm. You know, because there's also that fear of, you know, why are we actually doing it and, and going back to our intentions, intentions as well. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing. And, and also there's that thing of, um, in Islam, you know, we're encouraged, uh, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do our things privately. So if, mm -hmm. we're, if we're succeeding with something, you know, we don't have to always, you know, let the world know that we're succeeding or you know it, it, and sometimes it, it, it might actually affect somebody else you don't know you might have something that somebody else doesn't have so yeah. it's, it's all a form of there's such hikmah in protecting what we have and that kind of thing so I think it's just about striking a balance because I think there is a lot of goodness to be had but there's also really negative effects of social yeah. media so we just have to be careful, you know. I wanted to pick up on things. the point that you mentioned about um, how creating a persona and going back to the intention and everything. Like, there's people out there who are doing amazing work. Like, their substance and the work that they do on the ground is remarkable. Absolutely. But sometimes they can't do it without posting it, you know? So yeah. they, you kind of lose yourself in, yeah. the, in the cause. Absolutely. What, what advice would you give to somebody who's caught up in that? <sighs> this is really difficult because obviously, no one can ever say what's in somebody's heart you yeah, know yeah. you could somebody could be completely just they have the right intention and they're just trying to inspire others or even yeah. you know encourage people to do this especially when we're living in a world where you know giving to charity or or you know just doing something for the sake of Allah it's not encouraged so it is nice to have that encouragement um, on a platform that is, yeah, that is accessible to exactly it. but also at the same time I think it really comes down to every single individual everyone's yeah. responsible for themselves mm -hmm. so as I said to act responsibly with the internet um, and also just know that you know each one of us are going to stand before Allah so um, only we really know what our intention was and why we were doing it and so we should just have to always keep ourselves in check um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the only way I could you know comment yeah. on it because mm -hmm. you can't really tell I think um, with with the case of social media, we always think that, oh, you know, we could always delete our history. We could always delete our search history. But we kind of forget that we will never be able to hide anything from Allah. So at the end of the day, we may be able to hide it from our parents, from our friends perhaps, but we'll never be able to hide it from our Creator. And I think that's something we need to remind ourselves of whenever we're using social media mm -hmm. and um, in order to use it in a way which, you know, will, will help us. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with regards to showing yourself on social media, mm. do you think that people think about, you know, whether they're portraying a good image or a bad image? And if, if not, do you, think, do you think this is something we should consider when we're putting up pictures of ourselves or even quotes or, you know, That's statuses? the thing. I was actually going to ask each of you how you felt about this because obviously as, you know, it depends on your age group as well and, you know, how you view things. And um, I think personally, when you do put something out there, I don't think we're actually realizing the effects it might have mm -hmm. or who it's reaching. As I said before on Twitter, um, they, there was a statistic that said about 175,000 people are seeing just one tweet that mm -hmm. you tweet. So putting up a status or a, an image, you know, uh, whether we like to admit it or not, when we put an image up, it's the best version of what happened or what, what it looks like, you know? Yeah, yeah. We have to move the food around to make it look nicer, <laughs> or, you know what I mean? So just in that alone... Position the drink and exactly, the cutlery, don't that, worry, Just in that alone... <laughs> yeah. But just in that alone, it's very... Um, it can come across as quite inauthentic. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not being authentic with, with that, yeah. you're not essentially... It comes... Like, you're not really being authentic with who you are and how you're living. And so that's an element of deceiving and, and so deceiving yeah. is go, goes hand in hand with lying. So yeah. it's all kind of, because it's so subtly, like we've just accepted it as a social norm in our society, but we're not actually thinking about, you know, actually, what am I putting out? For what reason am I putting this out for? Um, and also you might influence someone's perspective uh, for good or bad. So mm -hmm. we have to be careful with what we're saying. Um, and again, we're going back to the image, you know, putting up images of look what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. There's an element of showing off. Um, yeah. That may not always be the case, you know. Um, some people really love to share things and yeah. with their friends and family. Um, but again, it's about having just the idea of, you know, is just making sure that we're responsible for kind of fostering natural, organic relationships and not just people who are out there watching our lives. Because yeah. that's, that's not natural, right? Yeah. It's not, yeah. That's not, not a natural yeah. friendship, you know, it's, it's give and take, it's, it's enjoying each other, you know, and not, it's not this kind of strange fandom. Kind of like when you think about 
the practicality of having followers. <laughs> like exactly. imagine yeah. the followers that you have on Twitter followed you around everywhere you went. Yeah, like, like yeah. in real life it would be kind of like it's quite it's shocking. Quite creepy, <laughs> like, yeah. It's yeah. Quite creepy. Yeah. But also on the other the other side of things, I will say that there's something there's a really an amazing phenomena that's come out of, of social media is that people that you wouldn't normally like stay in touch with over the years yeah. have suddenly become part of your life and then it kind of keeps relationships moving. True. Yeah. It's not exactly the most organic or natural way, but there's something, there's something quite nice about it. that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say there's there's two sides to it really. Definitely. Um, okay, but with the image that we're showing on social media, do you think that sometimes this image that we're building up, this persona, do you think it can be different to what our actual persona is or that it could be damaging to us or others? Um, Obviously, it depends what, what image or persona you're putting out. But again, if you have to even, if there is a persona, then that in itself is kind of damaging, you know? Yeah. It's that thing of like, you, there's an element of having two selves. Yeah. And um, you can't, there's no way that somebody can keep up with those two selves constantly. There's a great poet that writes about this. Um, uh, Nahira Wahid, actually, she says something amazing about um, having two tongues and they weren't, they weren't supposed to both live in the same mouth. So um, this is kind of like a metaphor for um, our, the two selves that we have on social media, the, the, the public and private self. Yeah. Obviously, it's good to have a private self, um, but at the same time, we should just make sure that those selves align, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're being authentic Muslims as well, you know? Absolutely. So, I mean, do you think, for young people, um, do you think young people tend to be objective in their use of social media or various outlets? I don't know. Um, well, I, I want to know what you guys think about this. Um, do you feel like many people of your age group, are they being objective? Or do you think that they kind of just post sporadically or whenever they feel like it? What, what do you guys think well, about that? Well, I have that? quite a few friends that like before they post any picture, like if it's of themselves or with their family or with their friends, they would send it to other people <laughs> just to like see, oh, what do you think of this picture? Do you think I'm going to get loads of likes on it? Do you mm -hmm. think other people would like this picture? So it's like people are specifically choosing the moments that look the best mm -hmm. just to like make themselves feel better. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, that goes back to getting validation, isn't it? Like, yeah, I think, yeah. I think, absolutely. I don't know how destructive that is, you know, like <sighs> put yourself out on social media for the very purpose of validating yourself, feeling good about yourself based on those likes. Absolutely, and also it's funny because it's almost become where like eyeballs have become the currency. So people need validation. It's not through any other means today, but you see businesses thriving off of social media yeah. off of uh, putting out that lifestyle you have to it's they go hand in hand you can't yeah. have a successful business for example you can't have a successful I don't know what organization. organization or anything without it you know you have to be quite live on social media and make sure that you know yeah, like sees. Many, many businesses are just like oh yeah to keep up with like all the people we need to go on social media I've even seen like some charities on social media just to try to get like Encourage noticed people, by yeah. people Absolutely. and encourage them to give charity and the thing is like we have to accept that we're living at an age where this is the reality so obviously if we do have a business and we do have great intentions of you know for forwarding our business um, we shouldn't be we should as long as we're using it in the right way With then the exactly yeah. then it can't, it's not necessarily a negative thing like we can't just say you know what we're not going to use the internet yeah. we're not going to use anything we're just going to pull like away possible. from the world yeah it's not the, realistic. the way you actually use social media you can use it to be such a powerful tool in in the sense that you can spread news about people who perhaps you won't see in the newspapers. Yeah, you know, yeah, like things. about things that you know perhaps you wouldn't really hear you would, about. Yeah, rare, yeah. rare but coming things, back like rare diseases. To, yeah, like absolutely. Um, it does raise awareness in the best way. But also coming back to your question that you were saying earlier, um, it also there is an element of people sort of just speaking. <laughs> it's especially I'll, I'll say Twitter. Um, it's great for that. Um, I think it's uh, fantastic that so many people learn so much from it. But also, who's who's giving out these bits of information? Where are we getting our knowledge How and sources? Are yeah, yeah, where are we getting our knowledge and sources from? Especially when it comes to Islamic teaching yeah. or, or the madhabs or anything like that. You know, we should definitely be taught that. You know, you have to do your research. You know, yeah. always 
especially to, I feel like it's a it's a platform for just anyone to say anything, anything. Yeah. and yeah. you know and everyone somebody will take it so in. So I think know? coupled with you know the individual you know kind of taking yourself into account as well as ensuring that you're putting authentic information out there yeah. and the balance between you know making sure you're not getting caught up in it all I think those are the two kind of main things that we can take from this discussion. Absolutely yeah. But Jazakallah Khair sister is really really insightful Thank alhamdulillah. You. Um, with social media becoming a very normal part of our lives, certain ills can often be overlooked or ha be harder to identify. If you find yourself having problems with any of the issues that we mentioned in our discussion, please check out the information on your screens now with organisations that can help. We're off to a break now, but do tweet us and let us know your thoughts on our discussion. That's at Islam channel, hashtag step up. We'll see you in three. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Step Up, the show to enable the young Muslimah to step up in her deen. As a young Muslim, it is important to be involved in the community around us and be active in aiding others when we can. This is a part of what being a Muslimah is all about. Today, Sister Khadija meets an organisation that does exactly that. Children of Adam is a charity based in the UK. It provides food, clothing and toiletries for the homeless. Let's find out more. today in Holborn at the Children of Erdem Outdoor Soup Kitchen. We often hear the phrase charity begins at home and whilst charity should be going to wherever it's needed the most we often forget that those who are also in need are on our very doorsteps and it's with this in mind that the charity the Children of Erdem was first founded. The Children of Erdem was organised by a fantastic woman named Hanan Shahata and a group of keen volunteers that set up initially after an iftar flash mob in Ramadan 2011. We meet up with one of their core volunteers, Samia, to find out a bit more. Assalamualaikum Samia. Tell, so tell me a bit about yourself, tell me a bit about Children of Erdem, how you guys started up. I'm actually a student at the moment, but I got involved in Children of Adam back in 2011 when Hanan, our founder, she did Ramadan only soup kitchen and then I got involved after like fasting Ramadan. I wanted to kind of give back a little bit after a month of fasting. And then after that, I just started coming every week and I got a bit more involved in the charity. And the charity basically feeds over 150 homeless people every week. So we give out hot meals, sandwiches, hot and cold drinks and sometimes desserts. And we have a yearly winter pack appeal where once a year we give out thermal clothing and winter clothing to all of our 150 homeless guests once a year in the winter. So what gave you guys the idea to start up this initiative? It was more about Hanan. She started it and I saw, actually saw it on her Facebook. And obviously after fasting in Ramzan and finding it quite tough, I, I felt like I need to go out there and help those, help people who can't afford to eat a meal every day. Who are your volunteers and who's most likely to volunteer and what kind of people do you see um, at Children of Erdem? We've had quite a few, like a, quite a big wave of different volunteers. Mostly, most of our volunteers are like professionals or students or sometimes people just walk past and they come and join us. But we have like a core team of about eight people that kind of make this all happen. We all have different roles. Uh, three, four of us pick up from the sandwich stores around here when they close and bring the sandwiches. Um, two of our volunteers who are like really dedicated, they bring the tables and the hot drinks and the cold drinks. And one of our volunteers brings desserts and kind of all the team together make this happen. You guys have been doing this for four years. Um, that must be quite tiring. It must be like it must demand a lot of attention um, and time and dedication. So, what aspect of this do you find the most rewarding? It, I think it started off like wanting to help people and feed people, and then it became a responsibility. But what I do find the most rewarding is that sometimes when you talk to these people and they tell you how much of an impact like a small charity like ours has on them, it it does make you feel like a lot better about what you're doing because. You know, most of these guys, they'll be standing here for like a couple of hours just for one meal at 6 p.m. 
So there is like a high level of desperation there and it's more about making a difference really. I feel like there's a stigma attached to being homeless and we, we kind of look down on that. So what kind of people turn up and what kind of people depend on children and them as a charity? Of course, like every, every time everyone talks about homelessness here, especially in London, people are just like, oh, these people are too lazy to work. You know, they should take some self-responsibility and all of these other things. Oh, they must be drug addicts or they must be alcoholics. And it's not, that is not the case. Yeah, there are some and there, there is always and that's something that's always going to exist. But I think with a lot of these people, they've just, you know, a lot of people, when the recession hit, when we first started, a lot of people have lost their jobs, lost families, lost their homes. And then, you know, honestly, anyone can find themselves here. I think like um, Shelter Charity said that we're, all of us are three paychecks away from being homeless. A lot of these people have had like really hard like family lives or really hard upbringings or just simply like lost their job. And you know, we all know how tough it is to kind of live in London and how expensive it can be. How does all your work within the charity tie in with your faith? I think my faith was the first thing that got me into it because I remember growing up like going to mosque and you know we were always told about how generous and humble and how like giving, giving our prophet was, peace be upon him, was in, in his charity work and he would always help kind of people. And I think because it was so tied to like Ramzan and you have a month of where you know you don't eat for like long hours and you kind of feel like there are people actually out there who are living like this and when you come here and you see it like I've so many times I've seen people here get our food and they'll just rip open the box and they'll just start eating it because they're that hungry. It, you have to be really desperate and have to be in a really bad situation to come and stand here for about five hours waiting for us to come and give you a ticket and you don't even know if you're definitely going to get anything. If anyone wants to help out with the children of Adam, how can they get started? How can they volunteer with you guys um, and what paths can they take? Everyone. We're literally 100% volunteer on charity. No, no money goes to admin or any of that. All of our money literally goes on paying for the hot meals, paying for our winter pack appeal where we give out thermal clothing, or it goes sometimes and very rarely we'll need to buy like a thermos or like some utensils that we need there. But the volunteers literally give up their time. There's nothing literally in it for them. So we're always looking for people to help us with our sandwich shops, people to help us with fundraising so we can keep going. Um, if anyone wants to get involved, they can send me an email at samya at thecitycircle.com. So COA is partnered up with a registered charity called The City Circle. So they handle all of our funds and volunteers and we work together to make this happen. So do you guys have a Facebook page, Twitter page, um, where people can sign up and follow you guys? Yeah, we have, a, we have a Facebook page called Children of Adam. You can always go on the City Circle website too. There's loads of information on there. What's an inspirational charity? What did you think, Sister Ruqayya? I think it's really good and important that Muslims are being involved in the wider community. Definitely. I'm sure it's inspired us all to become more active within our own local communities. Inshallah, I really hope so. Moving on, when we read back over the Sirah, we find many of the first Muslims accepted in Islam and made great sacrifices for the deen while they were still young. They saw the truth and the beauty and the conviction in the message and embraced it with an open heart. So we come to our Young Sahaba segment, where we take a look at the stories of some of these incredible individuals. Who are we looking at today? Zayd bin Haritha, one of my all-time favorite Sahabas. This is that boy's story. When he was eight, Zayd was kidnapped and sold as a slave. He was sold to Hakim ibn Hizam, who just happened to be none other than the nephew of Khadija radiallahu anha. On returning home to Mecca, Hakim presented the slaves he had bought to his aunt and told her to take one as a gift. Khadija looked at each slave and chose, yep, you've guessed it, Zayd. But Zayd's adventure was just starting. When she married Muhammad, peace be upon him, Khadija presented him with Zayd as a gift. And from that day on, the two were inseparable. But where on earth was Zayd bin Haritha's real family? Well, Zayd's father and mother had been trying to find their little boy for a long time. Finally, just when it seemed that all hope was lost, his father tracked him down to Mecca. Immediately, he set off and found himself at the house of our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him. He begged Muhammad for his son back, offering to pay anything for his freedom. 
But Muhammad, peace be upon him, cast the money aside. Of course he would give Zayd to them, but on one condition, that Zayd be brought forward and choose who he wanted to go with. So Zayd was called. He was simply overjoyed to see his father. But when he found out that his father wanted to take him, he looked at him and said, I'm not coming with you. His father, shocked, inquired why he was choosing to stay a slave. Zayd showed both love and wisdom as he replied, if you knew the man I'm with, even a little bit, of the way he treats me and the respect and honor we have for each other and the love we have for each other, then you would understand my decision. There's greater hope for me with him than with you. Now let's just stop for a moment. I know a lot of you may be thinking, well, obviously, he is the prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, after all. But no, all this actually happened before the revelation started. Zayd chose Muhammad, peace be upon him, over his own father. And when the revelation did come down, who do you think the first servant to accept Islam was? Yep, Zayd bin Haritha. And did I mention he was only 15 at the time? SubhanAllah, and who did this boy start off as? As a slave. An eight-year-old slave who found himself in the company of Muhammad Little did he know, this was just the beginning. The story of Zayd bin Haritha truly encapsulates the imagination of the Muslims, especially the youth. His stature is that of such magnitude that he is the only Sahaba to be mentioned by name in the Quran. SubhanAllah. But now we're off to a break. Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Step Up, the new series for the young Muslimah. Up next, we look at an upcoming talent, and today we delve into the world of words. Let's find out more. One of the most amazing things about us as human beings is that each of us have a unique set of skills and talents that allow us to contribute to society in different ways. I'm here today at this remarkable event celebrating young Muslim writers for the fifth year running. Hosted by Muslim Hands, we've had the opportunity to speak with a very, very special individual who has won a prestigious award here today. Let's find out more about her. I felt the rough sand scrub against my feet, chased salty orange crabs who pinched my pinky tight, so by firelight I would crunch into lemon seeping shells, feel the faint texture of sand resting on my tongue. In my other country, I fell in love with the pitter-patter of sticks on a drum, the click-clack of polished shoes on the wooden floor, the sweaty palms as we danced, the bagpipes, and the deafening sound from the band. I grew up here with red mud squelching between my toes, with warm sand colouring my feet white and the cool sea washing them clean. I grew up here drinking coconut juice under palm trees, sleeping on the barraza beneath the stars. But I also grew up here in Glasgow, in the Gorbals, with quick save the junkies and chucking snowballs, watching fireworks on the eighth floor of my council flat, listening to the bangs and cracks, watching the orange flames flower out. So, Sister Asfar, you just performed a really amazing performance for us tonight. What was your piece about? Tell our viewers a bit more about it. Well, my piece was called Origins. That's one of the pieces that I performed. Um, actually, it won the Tower Poetry Competition, which is Oxford University's competition for young people between the ages of 16 to 18, so it's for sixth form students. And the piece was an exploration of identity and belonging and home. So I was really going back to my roots. Um, my parents are from East Africa, different regions within that. So I was really trying to kind of 
reimagine my childhood within that and also explore the other aspects of my British identity, such as being from Glasgow and coming from a working class background. So it was really just like a homogenous form of identity. Where do you mainly get your inspiration from? Is it more like based on you as a person and your experiences or is there certain things that you know inspire you? As an artist, our main role, one of our main roles is to actually speak about the things which other people don't want to speak about. So sometimes that's controversial subjects. So most of my writing actually touches on controversial issues such as the face veil, such as domestic violence for example, female genital mutilation, these difficult subjects that people don't want to discuss. But I also get my inspiration um, from just uh, the environment, beauty and life and I write about the Quran and how I feel when, I, when I'm praying. So it's, it's a varying kind of perspectives. I get inspiration from lots of different things but I do try to ensure that whenever I write I'm delivering a message and that my voice is important. I'm discussing something that could change someone's life. The next poem I'm going to be reading is a celebration of life, of the little things that we usually take for granted but can always put a smile on your face. I can smell the heavenly aroma of pilau rice as I stir the sizzling onions, shooting sparks into the air and my nose twitches to the rhythm of their frantic melody. I can taste the fluffy candy floss as I shred it to pieces I can taste its cotton wallness, layer upon layer, like puffy clouds lingering in a mirage. So why do you think it's important for young Muslim women in particular, you know, dress the way that you're dressed, dress the way that I'm dressed, to, to perform or to, to write? <laughs> I think that's a big question. To be honest, when I first started performing or writing, and really being into poetry. I didn't think about myself, myself as a Muslim woman or as a black woman or even as a woman. I just wanted to write. And it wasn't until I started wanting to perform that I realized that the obstacles were there. So I think it's important to push those boundaries and push those obstacles because Muslim women have a place in wider society. We make such a huge contribution to a regular society by being in the home, raising children, raising the next generation, making sure that the foundation is there. But if we can also play a bigger role within the wider society, then that's great. I think it's important if we're going to teach young people, especially young women, to follow their dreams, and have ambitions. They need role models and examples of what that looks like. You can't push a child out into the world and tell them you can have anything and everything in the world if they don't have something which they can follow and have an example of. So I try to be that example for young Muslims. I think you're doing a very, very good job at it, mashallah. When women like yourself are going forth and, and using their talents and using their capabilities to convey a message to the masses, you shouldn't really have those preconceived obstacles that initially won't even be there, right? It's really important for for us to kind of just go for it and to like one thing that uh, one of my favorite authors Naima B. Roberts she said that if you're an intelligent woman you're an intelligent woman whether your face is covered or not and that same applies to sisters who wear hijab that you know if you are intelligent and you have those talents just go for it. This afternoon was very inspirational so um, it really I've been wanting to kind of put together a poetry collection and you know get my novel out there so you know, I'm doing an, an English literature and creative writing degree at the moment and I have so many opportunities and I think this afternoon just made me realise that if I have so many opportunities, it's about time that I actually grab them and go out there and do well, what I need to do. Well, best of luck for you, inshallah. I can see a lot of great things coming from you and a huge, huge jazakallah khair for talking to us tonight. Thank you. What an inspiring individual. It's a real pleasure to see young sisters confidently pursuing their dreams. Within Islam lies a constant emphasis to read, to work hard and to achieve. And to not shy away from investing in ourselves by identifying our skills and utilising them to serve humanity. We hope you feel inspired to exert your efforts into positively having an impact on the world around you.
Well, that's it for this episode. Next week, we discuss the issue of bullying and how it's affecting more young people than ever with the rise of social media. And we'll be looking at the effects of littering. Catch us again, same time, same place, next week. Until then, salams from all the team. Assalamu alaikum. Me, I'm trying to keep. I'm Hafsa. And I'm Khadija. So it's been an exciting. No, <laughs> Which provides clues. Clues. Wow, that's a new one. Clues. <laughs> You're really not Khadija, you know? Really not Khadija.